Have you ever been in a season of being in the desert, like a spiritual desert or a time of emotional desert, dryness and desolation? And, and as you've been there, kind of prayed through that time, or maybe you've been in a, in a time of a crisis um, in your life. Maybe you know what that's like to be in a crisis and you've prayed through that. Um, how long did you have to pray? Hopefully, we pray continuously. We pr- that's why it's called praying through. You pray through the season in the desert. You pray through the crisis. And too often we don't, though. We give up. And I, some, some of us do. Just kind of give up. And we cease to pray. And we need to continue to pray and seek God as we go through the deserts or as we experience the, the crises that come into our lives. Um, so today we're on day 33 of a 40-day journey, taking us to Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday. Um, and as we're on this journey, we've been learning and we've been applying uh, these, these spiritual practices of Scripture reading and praying and sp- praying Scripture and fasting and meditating on Scripture. And, and as we've traveled through this, we've, some of us have actually been experiencing the desert time and I've had a few people share with me that I've been in, this is, this is for me because I'm in this desert right now and I'm, I don't, I've never known what to do when I get in this place and this story of Jesus in the desert is ministering to me. So some of us have actually been journeying in the desert as we've gone through this. Others of us are on what we call the mountaintop or somewhere in between and, and as we're there, what we've been doing is preparing for the next time we find ourselves in the desert. Because if life has taught us anything, most of us, we realize that, that if we're not in a desert now, that, and if we're on the mountaintop, at some point we will be there again. That's life. It's full of ups and downs. And sometimes we're there. So the key for us is to stay connected to Jesus in the desert. And so as the backdrop of this, we've been actually uh, looking at the story of Jesus in the desert. Who's got your Bibles? Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 4. Or if you're using your digital device, as so many are these days, just punch that up however you do on your, on your YouVersion Bible app or your tablet. Um, if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. We have them in the book racks. We'd love for you to grab one if you don't have a Bible and grab the book rack Bible. And you can turn to page 735. That's where you'll find Matthew chapter 4, where we've been in for a while. And today we're kind of wrapping up this series as we continue with Jesus in the desert. So here's, here's where we're at. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And for 40 days and nights, he fasted. He didn't eat anything, and he became very hungry. And the devil, the tempter, the adversary, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, why don't you turn this stone into bread? Jesus would have been pretty hungry. And this is the first temptation that comes to any of us whenever we uh, try to fast or pray. There's some physical thing, some physical need. We need to eat that's there. And Satan will tempt us with those things to take it out of context. And what Jesus' reply was, no, because the Scriptures say, see, he was the Son of God, yet he quoted Scripture himself. The Scriptures say... Man does not live by bread alone. People don't just live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I like to think that when Jesus was saying that, he was saying, only the words from the mouth of God am I going to listen to. You just shut up. But Satan didn't. Satan said, oh, okay. So he took him somehow, he took him to the top of the temple in Jerusalem. And he showed him from this place. He's like, hey, why don't you jump off? If you are the Son of God, don't the Scriptures say that God won't let you be harmed. Actually, the angels will hold their hands up and catch you, and you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. See, Satan twists the Scripture sometimes to take it out of context to give these temptations. And he does this with Jesus, and Jesus says, no. well, the Scriptures also say, don't put God to the test. So that's where we find ourselves today. We'll pick up in verse 8 and read the remainder of the story. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Pray with me. Father, we love you so much and thank you for this story which has captured us in the last five weeks. 
as we realize that as we travel this life and our faith journey many times takes us through the desert and we're not alone. If we've learned anything and if we take anything away, may we realize we are not alone, that you are with us, that many times, all the time, your spirit is leading us when we say yes to you. And we find ourselves in these, these desert places, desolate places, where we just feel so spiritually and emotionally dry May we recognize your Spirit is leading us. And may we continue to pray through and continue to walk with you all the way. Now, Lord, Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to you to be our teacher today, that you would uh, impart upon us and to our hearts and our minds your word so that it may affect our actions and our attitudes, that we may be the children of God, the church of God, and that we would uh, bring glory to your name, Jesus. We say yes to what you have for us. In Jesus' name, everybody said. If you'll take the outline you should have been handed when you came in today, you'll see um, we're going to kind of go through four steps of how to get you through the desert. And so really every sermon in this series we've been in has been about, you know, how do we get through the desert? How, how do, what does it look like to travel through this desert? And so today I'm just kind of wrapping this up with this last part of the story, this last temptation that we look at of Jesus and uh, take these four steps. And the first one is simply don't panic. When you find yourself in the desert place, don't panic. When you find yourself facing a crisis time, don't panic. I know it's easier said than done, right? I mean, what's the first thing you do when somebody says, don't panic? Panic, right? That was, uh, I had to share this because it was just my birthday a few weeks ago, and my mom calls me every year, or if I see her on my birthday, and she reminds me of all these details about my birthday because there's some things about our life that we just don't know unless somebody tells us, and birth is one of those things because I was there, but I have no memory of it other than what I was told. And so my mom calls me and tells me this, refreshes me on a story I've heard numerous times in 46 years now, and it was, you know, when you were born... And there was, your dad was there and your mamma, which was my mother's mom. So her mom was there. And she had come to stay with us while the baby was born. And you were supposed to be born on the 7th of March, but it was the 8th of March. And, and so she was already worried that, that something was wrong because you were a day late. <laughs> okay. And this was the first time, you know, you were the first child and your dad and I were young and we didn't know much. We thought mom did, but... Every time I, my mom said, every time I yelled out with a pain, they said, give her another shot. And so the, she said, I was so loopy, I didn't know what was going on. And then at some point, you flipped upside down. See, I've always been kind of off, I guess. You, you flipped upside down. And when they came in, they said to your mama and your daddy, now don't panic. Right? When the doctor comes in and says, now don't panic. But the baby's turned upside down, and we're going to have to wait. And she says, my mamma, her mom, went into hysterics, started screaming in this, this waiting room, oh, my goodness, it's going to be a breech birth, it's going to be a breech birth, and started really flipping out, the word I use, flipping out. And then they wanted to give my mom another shot of drugs, and I asked my mom this time, why didn't they give the shot to mamma? <laughs> I never thought of that. Well, I, turned, I got turned around. This happens in my whole life, I guess. I get things upside down. I get weird stuff in my system, and then I get turned around the right way. Well, that was the thing was they, the, they came in and said, don't panic. And that's the first thing we do, right, when someone says, don't panic. Well, the devil comes to Jesus for the third temptation. Now, keep that in mind. And this time it's basically what his temptation is. Worship me, he says, and I will make you king of kings and lord of lords. Worship me and I will give you a kingdom that is above all kingdoms. I'm thinking, wait a minute. Jesus is already the King of kings and the Lord of all. He's already, his kingdom is, is about to come, come into fullness for all time and eternity and be a kingdom that is above all other kingdoms. And here's this temptation. He says, really what Satan is tempting him with is power, with immediate riches and power and control. And that's really when I think about the times that we go through a crisis or, or when we go through the deserts in life. Somehow, many times, they're connected with finances and provision. It's not so much the temptation to get more, but something happens that affects what we have. 
And then that can send us into crisis mode. That can send us into panic mode. That can send us into a place where we find ourselves going through the desert. And the Bible doesn't teach that money and riches are wrong, but that a life focused on these things over God is sin and evil. I want you to hear that. That the Bible doesn't teach us that money and riches are wrong, but that a life focused on that over God is sin and evil. Now I realize we don't like those two words, so let's look at them. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's a very misquoted verse. You may have heard it many times. You know, money is the root of all evil. No, 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 no. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I know that that was not just a first century problem. It happens today, and I've seen it, that people get consumed with what they don't have or they want more. It's greed, or else it's just something that, they, that sends them into this place of, I don't have something, so I've got to do, do something, and it's sometimes even illegal that they do. Two words that we don't like, evil and sin. And you hear it in our culture like this. You've had the conversation probably. Well, how can you, how can you say this is evil or that is evil? I don't, some people will even say, I don't even think evil really exists. Anybody heard that? I mean, I've heard that. I, I don't even think evil really exists. Or, or sin, too. How can you say that that's a sin and that's a sin and that's a sin? When, when and this is our culture, and I don't understand in our culture, it probably may include some of us in here, that the idea is, well... What's true for you is true for you, but that's not necessarily true for me. So what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. So let's not call anything a sin. So that's, that's, the, that's where we're at. And what we see here is that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and it causes sin, which is a, a, a connected with our many griefs. So the, and originally, the Bible was written in Hebrew, the, the Old Testament. The Bible that Jesus knew, the, the scriptures that Jesus quoted to Satan, to the devil, were Hebrew. And in Hebrew, the word evil is ra. Let me hear you say ra. Ra. It almost sounds like, oh yeah, that's not a good one. <laughs> evil. And it literally means this, adversity and sorrow. The literal word translated as evil means adversity and sorrow. Now tell me that doesn't exist. Adversity and sorrow do exist, and you've probably experienced both, adversity and sorrow. Evil is when my life experience is the opposite of what God has planned for me. When I live in the opposite of what God's plan for me is, I experience adversity and affliction and sorrow, and I wasn't supposed to. We were created to live in peace with our God, but because... Evil is something that's very real. Adversity and sorrow is very real. It takes us into this place that we were never originally created to be in any way. Read the first two chapters, Genesis. We're supposed to be in this, this full-on journey with God with no adversity, no sorrow, no crises, no desert experiences, but yet we do. Now the other word, sin, in Hebrew the word is avon. I mean, you say avon. Now, if you see it up here or, or on your notes, it, it, um, it looks like Avon. It looks like Avon, so I don't want any, you know, any ladies that use Avon or buy Avon or sell Avon. I don't want your husbands going, hey, I told you that stuff's evil. <laughs> Avon, it means to make crooked, literally, to make crooked, to make crooked. Nothing quite makes the way more crooked than anxiety and worry about finances, being able to provide something for ourselves or for our loved ones. Worry and anxiety about these things will take you off course faster than just about anything else. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 31, So don't worry about having enough food or drink or clothing. Why be like the pagans who are so deeply concerned about all these things? Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs and he will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is kind of a, um, uh, I guess, a trailer or commercial for what starts next week. And we're, we'll begin on Easter Sunday. A few weeks we'll be looking at what would Jesus undo. And some of you guys have heard that or seen the, the little invite cards to come join us on Easter. What would Jesus undo? And I'm just going to tell you now, one of the things Jesus came to undo is worry and anxiety. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But, but Jesus here, after he tells them this, don't worry, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Everything, your heavenly Father knows what you need. Trust him. A short time later, Jesus found himself being taken into custody, being arrested 
basically for saying, I am the Messiah. And they said, blasphemer, and they arrested him, and they were going to kill him. And for Jesus, this was a great crisis that his 40 days in the desert three years before had prepared him for. And that he had walked with his disciples, his followers, for three years. He had been preparing them for this crisis that was about to take place when he was arrested. Because they were about to go through this, this time of a journey of, of very much a desolate, scary place for them spiritually. So when the crisis comes, when you're in the desert place, don't panic and do pray. Say it. Don't panic, do pray. Say it. Don't panic, do pray. If you get nothing else out of this today, please remember that. Don't panic, do pray. Our prayer team ministry has been on overtime lately because we've taken a stand. We said Jesus is the subject of everything we do, and that's more than a catchphrase. It's more than something that, that's going around. We are making it our reality, and because of that, we're taking a stand, and one of those things we're taking a stand is against human trafficking. And we're finding ways. What can we do? And we're going to continue to be a part of our conversation. We did a, you, you guys gave a great offering to help with our 1,000 by 1,000 traffic light ministry program that's around the world we're involved in now. And we're going beyond that. And what can we do? And ever since we've done that, I have been overwhelmed with what's been happening. There's been, you call it a spiritual attack or whatever you want to call it, but there has been, it brought on full. But we're not going to back down. We're going to don't panic and do pray. And we'll keep getting prayer chain calls. We'll, we'll keep getting the text messages. And we'll keep coming down here and bringing it before the Lord every time we come together because we're going to don't panic and do pray. Jesus' response to the devil was, get out of here. It wasn't like, you know, that kind of thing where I can have all, get out of here, I can have everything. No, it was no, get out of here. Go away from me. He says, I'm going to worship only my Father God. That's it. That's it. You might as well just shut up now. I'm not going to worship you. I'm going to worship only my Father God. See, Jesus knows that the key to walking through life's dark places is to walk with God in prayer. Jesus knows that. He shares that with us. He shows us that. In Philippians 4, 6, tells us, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. That's one of, the, one of the keys to staying away from worry and anxiety as we walk through the desert is to be thankful for what God's already done. What has He done? Jesus went to the cross. He's forgiven my sins and made a way for me to have eternal life with God and to have peace and joy through whatever life throws at me. If He never did anything else for me ever, that's enough. That's it. There's nothing too great for God's power. There's nothing too small for His care. This is why we do pray. But years later, after this experience in the desert, Jesus and His followers, they prepared for that, that crisis that they were about to face. And Jesus was going to be killed. And He took them to this place called Gethsemane. He took them to this place where they grow the olives. And there, in Luke 22:40, he says, it says, when they arrived at the place, He said, pray that you don't give in to temptation. He says, you're going to face it. Don't panic. Do pray. Jesus says to his followers, us in the desert, start praying. And don't stop praying. When you experience a crisis in your life, start praying and don't stop praying. When you've given everything and done everything you can, nothing seems to work. Keep on praying. When I feel like I, there's just no point in this, keep on praying. Well, nobody else called me to pray with me. Keep on praying. You, pray, and keep on praying. Hebrews 10.36 says, You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a very little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and, he, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Don't give up. Keep praying. Believe. Believe. A pastor named Robert Schuller put, says this. There, there's four ways how God always answers prayers. I thought this was good, so I wanted to share it. Four ways that God always answers prayers. So sometimes they'll say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. Oh, yeah. 
He always answers prayers, and here's four ways. When the request is not right, God says no. That's first. When the request is not right, God says no. And that kind of rubs us the wrong way a little bit, some of us, because we kind of feel like, well, God wants me to be happy, right? I mean, isn't that, isn't that really the gospel? Jesus came so I could be happy? No. Jesus cares more about your holiness than your happiness. He cares more about your commitment than your comfort. And sometimes out of our desire for happiness and comfort, we make requests that are just not right. I have. I really have. And God has said no. And I've realized, you know what? I've got to get over that. I've got to realize, okay, then I want to make the right, right requests. When the timing is not right, God says slow. Sometimes I'd rather just say no and get it over with. <laughs> but when the timing isn't right, God says slow. There has been things that God has shown me or shown me or called me to do, and I'm ready to do it. That's how I'm wired. I'm the, that's me. I'm like, here's the hill. Let's take it. And I don't, I don't want to make the journey to get there. I just want to take the hill. So God has been teaching me my entire life that it's a journey. You can't just go take the hill because you miss everything in, in here. So he says, slow. And there have been things that God showed me, and I'm like, and then four years later, I'm like, is this ever going to happen? When our son Christian was born, we thought, okay, we want to have another one. After two years, we thought, we'll have another one. Thirteen years later, <laughs> there was Jericho. It was like, when the timing isn't in, in, right on with God's timing, he says, slow. When you're not right, God says, grow. What do you mean when I'm not right? I'll just be honest. There's times I have come to God and made prayer requests of things and I was not right. I mean, I, was, I wasn't right. I wasn't thinking right. I wasn't feeling right. It's selfish. There's things I have I've prayed for. God, give me. Would you just give me? I really want to do this. And God says, hey, grow. Well, he says, grow up, really. <laughs> grow up. Grow. You need to grow in this time, in this season. And the last one, when everything is right... When I'm right, the request is right, and God's timing is right, God says, go. He gives the green light. He says, yes, let's do this. Let's go. So God does always answer prayer. So don't panic and do pray. And as you continue the journey, declare praise along the way. Declare praise. Through the, through the desert, yes, declare praise. Through the times of crisis, declare praise. Through the times when it's just like, I don't really feel like praising right now. Praise anyway. In 1999, I was a, a counselor at a youth camp, and I was a youth pastor, student ministries pastor, in my first year of full-time ministry, um, doing this full-time. And I took it as a group of, of, it was a great camp for me, because it was a junior high camp, and I had one junior high boy and ten junior high girls, and of course the men can't counsel, be in the girls' cabin, so I brought this adult youth, a worker to come and be with the junior high girls. Ten junior high girls, go have them! And I'm in a cabin with my one boy and a couple of other youth pastors and pastors, and they're, they're, they had one, so we had a good little group. We got to meet different people, and we didn't have to hear all the girls giggling and being silly and all that stuff. That's beside the point. On the very first night, if you've ever been to camp or camp meeting or revival, you always want to start off with a boom, don't you? The very first night, they had brought this, it was a high school band, to, to lead the worship for a junior high group. And they got up there. It was not good. I'm not saying I didn't like that kind of music. I'm not saying it was, it was too loud or too quiet or whatever. They just, it just weren't good. They weren't a good band. The, the girl that the sang wasn't good. They had no, there was no timing. There was no rhythm. They, they were off. Everything was off on the very first song. And I remember I was standing up ready to just, yes, you guys ready? You guys ready? Yes, let's do this. And it was just like, and all the air went out of this entire place. And they led this, this song, and they ended it, and it was just dead, silent. And this girl that was up there leading, this teenage girl, said, Woo! You guys ready? You guys glad to be at camp? Nothing. You could hear crickets, literally, because this was an open-air tabernacle kind of thing. You could literally hear the crickets. And she said, well, praise God anyway, and let's sing another song. And I was so convicted. It was, God just was like, you're not a leader. There's a leader up there. She doesn't have it all together. She doesn't have the greatest singing ability or talents or, or anything, but she's praising me anyway. And you need to lead the way for these junior high students. And I started praising God anyway. And that week was an amazing week of camp. 
that had nothing to do with me, had everything to do with God and someone's ability to say, you know what, we're going to praise God anyway. That's what it's all about. So how can I praise God when I'm in the desert place? Why praise Him when I'm, when I'm in the middle of the crisis? Why praise Him? Because He's still God. He's still God. He's worthy of our praise whether everything is going our way or not because He's still God. When Jesus responded to the devil's temptation by declaring praise to God, what happened? He said, the devil went away. <laughs> Jesus said, you know, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm not going to quote Scripture at you. I'm just going to start praising my God. Go away. And the devil went away. That's what happens. We get our focus on Christ. We get our focus on God and praise Him and worship Him anyway. You know what happens? It goes away. When you're facing the temptations, guys, Ladies, listen, when you're facing a temptation, don't give in to this lie that, well, I have to give in to this because I just can't say no. It's just so overwhelming. Uh uh-uh. Start praising God. Start praising God anyway. And you know what happens? Temptation starts to lessen and it goes away. You'll even forget about it because you get so, if you just get lost in praising God anyway. Praise the one who never ceases to be with us. The God who stops evil in His tracks. Praise this God. The one who delivers us from sin. Praise Him. So there's three things I want to give you can give God praise for when you're in the desert or when you're facing a crisis. And any time, even today, if you're on the mountaintop. Give God praise, first of all, for His love. Praise God for His love. Isaiah 41.10 says, Don't panic, I'm with you. He's with us because He loves us. He says, there's no no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady. I'll keep a firm grip on you. We can praise God for that because He loves us. Second, praise God for His wisdom. Praise God for His wisdom. James 1, 5 says, if you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask Him, and He will gladly tell you, he will not resent your asking. Sometimes I think we don't ask God for wisdom or what He wants us to do because we're afraid of what He might want us to do. But we need to ask, and He will give us wisdom. Because I'd much rather be uncomfortable for a little while and be in God's will than try to try to try to try to make it about being comfortable and be completely out of God's will. And then thirdly, give God praise for His power. For His power. Psalm 21.13 says, We praise You, Lord, for all Your glorious power. With music and singing, we celebrate Your mighty acts. So praise God for His love, for His wisdom, and His power. Even when you're in this desert place. Even when you're facing a crisis. Praise God anyway. And I can't explain systematically how it works. And I know in some of us, we, get, we want to reason things out. And, and I can't tell you, I just know from experience, my own, and from others that have shared with me, Praising God through the storm. Praising God through the desert place. Praising God through a time of crisis delivers peace. It delivers the kind of peace. Unexplainable. A kind of joy that I can't even put into words. Joy unspeakable. This is what happens in the desert place. And as we do this, God delivers peace. Now I said there's four steps. This is a step that you can't take on your own. God has to deliver the peace, and He does deliver the peace. And I've been there so many times. Overwhelming peace in the desert place. Perhaps you've been through a crisis, or you've been in the desert, and God has delivered peace. Would you just slip your hand up and hold it up? If you have, know what it's like to experience peace when there shouldn't be peace, if you know what it's like, just hold your hand up for just a second, because some of us don't know what that's like. And I want us to look around just for a second and say, you know what, there's a lot of folks in here that have been through crisis, that have been through spiritual deserts, that have been, that have been in times of pain and agony, and God gave us peace through that. And there may be a time when you need to hear their story to be reminded of that. So just take note, it's pretty much everybody in here. We need to share. This is what being a part of the family of God is about, is encouraging one another through these times of crisis that, you know what, God gives peace through those. And our story of Jesus in the desert, it winds up like this. Angels come into care for Jesus. They come to provide for his needs in this desert place in the face of temptation. In its most desolate and alone moment, Father God delivers peace. In the desert place of your heart and mind, and often in our relationships, 
the furthest thing from us we feel like is peace. But God says, I'm, I, want you to, I want you to walk with me and I'm going to deliver peace in your mind, in your heart, in your relationships. See, our minds, our minds are what we think. Our minds are our are, are, are attitudes about life. Our hearts, our hearts are our emotions or our feelings about life. And our relationships, it's, it's, it's about all the circumstances all put together. The circumstances, the people, the events, the threats, the successes, the failures, the temptations, the desires, the plans, the motives, all of that. And God desires for us to walk with Him. So right in the middle of it, He delivers peace that we so desperately need. Peace to make the right decisions, to make the right choices. Philippians 4, 7 says, Before you know it, a sense of peace, God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. It's wonderful what happens when Christ when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Do you need this wholeness? Do you need this peace that Jesus offers to settle you down? Do you need Christ to displace worry at the center of your life and replace it with faith that He can do anything, that He is God and He is good and He loves you? His desire is to walk with you. Do you need to trade your worries about stuff about things, about finances, for the real riches of God's kingdom. Do you need Jesus in the desert?